Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Bishop Sally. We're just going to give folks a couple more minutes to get in here. I'm I think I'm just realizing that the meeting might not go live until I log in as, or at least someone with a diocesan staff account does. So um, we'll be, we'll figure that out as we go forward. We've changed some of our Zoom protocols and it, you know, we're, we discover little surprises occasionally along the way. So uh, So we'll give folks another minute or two to get here. And then once that happens, I'll post the agenda in the chat as we have before. So we don't take up the whole screen with the agenda, um, but we will uh, we'll have it there. The If we wait and post it too, if we post it too quickly, the people who join later don't have access to it. And then we end up posting and reposting and posting again. Um, but we'll give it just a couple of moments for people to get here and we'll probably start as soon as the clock ticks over onto 704 or thereabouts. So, um, yeah. How's everyone been? You know, firmly into the Easter season and uh, hopefully folks are, are doing well and, and you know. Wait, been... Waiting for ordinary time. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. We're getting close, but it's also ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also I'm waiting for just more of these lovely evenings. I think this is my first evening meeting from home where I'm looking out onto daylight instead of Good watching for you. darker and darker. So that's been yes. it's nice. Yeah. So um, I do think we've got how many folks do we have? We have about 46. We ha usually have a few more, but maybe not a lot more. So we'll we'll wait and see, see how it goes. So. Maybe one more minute, not quite. So how has Easter been for everyone? Have you found that we've heard from some folks where church has just been uh, continued to be a, a really lovely, um, feels like it's back pre-pandemic days. And some other folks are, are noticing that it's almost back. Easter was pretty good, but it might not be quite the same in the weeks since. So how are you finding it? Anything uh, different or unusual or anything extra, extra blessings or extra challenges in this season? Certainly how many we had for Easter was very impressive. So that was good. The services since then, although I would say that they are not as impressive as they might have once been, they've been better than what it has been recently. So it's progress. Progress is good. Absolutely. And we know from what we're seeing that things are just a little different than they were before. Fran, are you raising your hand? If so, please jump in and share. Um, well, I was away for a couple of months um, in February and March, but I was home for Easter and Easter was good. And um, I, I think the, the week, the week, Sunday following Easter was kind of sparse, but then it's come back up again. And though certainly not pre-pandemic, but better than it had been. So I feel, I feel good about it, actually. Wonderful. Well, it's great to hear. And we are uh, we are in a we are on a journey and and to hear better than it had been and and to see things continuing that's great news um there's a note in the chat that it was great holy week attendance holy week and attendance is staying up again that's exactly what we hope and and pray will happen so i am going to offer an opening prayer then i am going to post the agenda for tonight in the chat the longer i wait the more people will get to see it and then we'll just jump into updates and check in and connection and all of that good stuff. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And with you. Let us pray. Oh God, by your grace, you have called us in this diocese to a goodly fellowship of faith. Bless our clergy and lay leaders and all our congregations and people. 
Grant that your word may be truly preached and truly heard, your sacraments faithfully administered and faithfully received. By your spirit, fashion our lives according to the example of your Son, and grant that we may show the power of your love to all among whom we live, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Wonderful. That's one of my favorite prayers from the from the Book of Common Prayer. So I like to use those when I can. I just put the agenda in the chat and um, a few updates from me. Um, first, I just wanted to share with you uh, where we are in terms of all of the many things going on in the Diocese of New Jersey right now. It has been a little more exciting than I anticipated. Uh, some of the things we're working through are uh, we're not things we uh, were expecting at this season, but we are exactly where uh, we should be. And by the grace of God, we are moving forward. Um, we are we continue to um, see what we're dealing with in terms of getting our financial house in order and the work that is before us. Uh, and the uh, and that is a good thing. Um, what I've said to a few people is I feel like I can see the bottom of the pool now. We know what we're looking at, although we might not have the specific details. Uh, we can see three areas in which we've had uh, some interesting challenges in terms of our, our budget and our financial reality. One is, as you probably know, the Marks of Mission giving. We receive funds. The diocese receives funds from uh, the congregations. We use those, those funds for a variety of different things, from our operating costs to support for vulnerable congregations to payments to the national church to support the mission and ministry of the wider Episcopal church uh, to you know everything you might imagine. Um, and we have, not, we have not received the numbers that we budget for or anticipate for a while now. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is congregations have some financial challenges and we know that just as we do, you have those as well. Um, and with, uh, with COVID and everything else that goes on, um, we, uh, we find that, um, oh, there it goes. It's finally in the chat, sorry. Um, so hopefully you can see the agenda now. Uh, we know that congregations are not uh, always able to support in the way that they have in the past. Our diocesan marks of mission um, assessment, the the uh, the request that you receive each year, until uh, in 2019, that moved from being an optional pledge to actually being uh, not optional, but something that we have structures for engaging con with congregations when they're not able to pay the amount requested. But um, because of COVID, we did not uh, we didn't do the work with congregations to that we that would have. Uh, we gave people a bit of a break in COVID knowing that uh, the funding wasn't there. Um, and so we, uh, as we're on the other side of COVID at this point, we have to, we're going to have to take a look at uh, the funding that we receive versus the funding that's requested. Um, and just to be a little transparent about that, that's not private information. We uh, it's, it's shared every year as part of our convention information. But one of the things that we'll do is I'll share that in a few weeks in one of our good news in the Garden State emails, uh, just so people are aware uh, of, of where we are and which congregations uh, are are able to meet their, their request and which congregations we're going to need to work with to assess. Because we count on that funding, just as you count on the pledges you receive from people in the congregations, we count on the funding we receive from congregations to support the work that we do and the mission and ministry that we're engaged in. Another area is that we have uh, a number of properties that we have sold over time, closed congregations, and we sell the property. Often we sell them uh, to other churches, and we have held the mortgages on those for those churches. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, with the pandemic disruption and, and in the years since, uh, what we are finding is that we have not always received the payments that were due to us from our mortgages on the properties that we have sold. And... Um, what that means, uh, as I look at the numbers for the past year, the past year and a half or so, that's almost $300,000 is what it looks like. That's a large number. It's a significant portion of our budget. Um, and so we'll be doing some work to assess uh, why that money isn't coming in as it should uh, and the people, the mortgages that we've worked with and trying to figure out a way forward that will help us to get that a little bit more on track. Um, and we've got a couple of other areas where we're aware that there are uh, the, the income we're expecting has not been coming in at the levels that we hope for. Um, 
but our spending has has kept up at the levels that we've committed uh, to spend. And that's good news because a lot of the spending that we that we do, you know, no church budget right now has a whole bunch of extra funds in it. The diocesan budget is the same. There's not a lot that we could trim down if we were looking at trimming things. Um, but some of our, much of our budget is spent on congregational support. And the congregational support monies are often the, the, that's the funds that should come from a property sale that, you know, the mortgage payment isn't made. We send the money out anyway, because we know that congregations are depending on that. We know that clergy won't get paid if we don't send it, that health insurance won't be paid for and families will be without coverage. So we've made the decision to continue that regardless. Um, what we'll be doing over the next few months is getting an accurate handle on where we are so we have a more realistic sense of our numbers. Um, but we are doing the work needed to get some clarity there. Uh, I had a meeting this morning regarding the 2019 audit. We are one brief meeting away from signing off on completion of that, which will bring us up one more audit up to date. We have increased our support for the audit process, and we are at a point where we are deciding whether it makes more sense to tackle 2020 next or 2020, 2021, and 2022 all in one batch. Um, and the decision that will be made will be made by the staff and the, the audit committee and the experts in that area. But I wanted to share with you that we are definitely making progress in terms of our audit process. Uh, I'm grateful to our audit committee. Paul Wolfgang is the chair of that group. He's also on the standing committee and he's one of our trustees uh, for the diocese. I'm grateful to the trustees who have been um, for, for a, an assignment that they signed on for as a quarterly meeting, we've started meeting monthly now. So I appreciate the, uh, the effort and the support there. The decisions about real estate rest with the trustees. I am a member of, of I guess I chair the trustees. So um, I'm part of that conversation, but we do have external. It's not just the bishop making up the bishop's mind about what we do. It's, a, it's an organized process that's intended to be um, appropriately supported by people from across the diocese. And we have great people involved in that work. Our treasurer and our budget and finance committee have been doing wonderful work. Uh, they've been especially helpful in reaching out to all of the congregations and clergy where the marks of mission giving for the past year or so has not been quite where we anticipated. So we have a clearer picture of what's going on and we can work within that context. Um, and I really appreciate uh, the day-to-day -day support that especially that the treasurer has offered to our finance team. Um, Standing Committee and Diocesan Council have also been tremendously helpful in this, uh, being ready and willing to meet and provide wisdom and advice appropriate to their areas on a number of occasions. And of course, then we have the staff. Our finance and administration staff have done a really wonderful job in stepping into the situation and helping to get things on track. Um, what I said at convention, gosh, that's two months ago now, was that we had contracted to bring on um, a consultant who would serve as our CFO uh, until as we were getting a, a handle on this. And then we would uh, engage in, once we had this cleaned up, we would engage in a, a process to bring on someone permanent. Uh, the, the firm we worked with to bring him on, we had, we had a, an arrangement with someone, uh, contacted me on the Friday evening prior to Holy Week to let me know that this person had received another offer from the place where they were already working, a, a, an offer to retain them. They had accepted it. And so they weren't turning up on the Monday morning when they were due to start. So um, I let the staff know and they started work. And then right after Easter, uh, our finance staff sat me down and said, uh, and asked if what they said was that they were actually doing, getting ahead on things and starting to get a handle on it. And they knew the systems. And would we be willing, would I be willing to work with them and not bring someone in immediately, but let them do the cleanup part. Um, and then we'll bring someone in when we have more clarity uh, on a, a longer term trajectory. Since the work is happening and the people we now have on our finance team are Sarah Page. Many of you will remember Sarah from before when she was our diocesan controller and was a key person in communicating to congregations around financial matters. She was brought back as our office manager. She started February 1st, and I have uh, I have given her responsibility for management of the finance team. Uh, she's doing a great job. Uh, I have We have um, Tanya Rainey, who has been our controller for four years now, and uh, she 
uh, continues in that role. And she, again, is, is, is just, it's been phenomenal to watch the ways that the team is working together and the help that they are offering to, to each other and to congregations. And finally, um, many of you will remember Manny Strauss, who was our staff accountant until 2022 when he retired. He's returned uh, to us on a more than half time basis, working until we get this result. This is great because we have the people in place who actually built the system and know the system. So it's a matter of just getting, getting things organized and getting things uh, working with the with the group. And when when we had Manny and Sarah and Tanya working on things um, some years ago, that's that's when the audits were being done and uh, things were moving. So it's good to have folks back and to know that things are moving in the right direction. Um, I think that is is really things are uh, things are going well there. Um, we are slow progress, but it is absolutely progress. And I don't think we can do this work too quickly. We would we would start to miss things and, and it would not be as accurate. Um, so I give great thanks for them. And uh, if you have any questions, you know who you can reach out to. Uh, you may have had their email address for five or 10 years, which is, I think, wonderful uh, to see the continuity and the, and the way that folks are working together. Uh, so that's a little bit about our staff and who is available to support you. Uh, we are still working to discern next steps regarding communications. We have um, also some work underway to figure out what we want to do around congregational support. We know that's an area where we have a need. Uh, we also have uh, we have plans for that, but in light of everything else, we're uh, moving slowly indeed around that. And I'll keep you posted as anything changes. I'm committed to transparency in this process and in this work so that you can see and know what's going on. You should be able to get that information from your from your bishop and your diocese. And uh, we are, as I said, gently moving in the right direction. Um, a couple of small updates on the ordination process. We have uh, resumed the, the process with folks who are already in discernment with us. We actually had an ordination uh, a month ago of someone who uh, had been a transitional deacon. I ordained him to the priesthood, and so that process is finished. We have had, uh, we have had a number of folks move uh, who were postulants that have had meetings, or, or I think the last person in, who is currently a postulant in the diocese, the meeting is already scheduled for it's either Friday or Monday uh, for the priesthood uh, and for the diaconate. We are moving people forward through the process and making decisions uh, in support of their vocations and, and next steps. We're also beginning the process of uh, working with people who were partially, uh, were engaged before, but not at the level of postulant or, um, or candidate for ordination. So uh, the Commission on Ministry, uh, we are in the process of, of reforming that a little bit, but the the folks who have been involved, the chairs of the Committee on the Diaconate, the Committee on the Priesthood, and some other uh, members who've been part of the conversation, we continue to have meetings scheduled with people who are in discernment with us. And the good news is that in a couple of weeks, we will be uh, reopening the applications for those that we discovered uh, were in some stage of discernment but were maybe not known to us when uh, we, we started the pause on the ordination process. So, um, that feels really good, knowing that people who've been waiting are able to move ahead. Related to that, we have um, we have several folks who will be going to seminary in the fall, new people who are starting the discernment process. Because the, uh, the MDiv program, which is the degree required for ordination, um, if you go through the seminary track, the MDiv program is uh, at uh, is being offered for free, at residential along with housing and and, and and similar costs being covered, uh, being provided at Virginia Theological Seminary. And there's an online program being offered. I believe it is also completely free of charge through General Theological Seminary. So we have people who are participating in uh, formation for ordained ministry through the seminaries, and that is great news. And we will be working with them as we begin and continue the, the ordination process discernment conversations. If there is someone in your congregation who would like to be in discernment for ordained ministry with us, um, then right now they should be having a, a parish discernment process or a congregational discernment process uh, with the clergy in the congregation. Or if you don't have clergy, but you know there's someone, then talk to your 
uh, talk to your regional, your convocation dean, or talk to the, um, or talk to Canon Susanna Cates, who has been, is the uh, Canon for Formation and Vocations, and will help you get on track with that process for people. Um, the application itself should open up in a few weeks and people can apply and, and then they'll be officially in our discernment process and we'll be able to continue those conversations. So we are moving forward in a number of areas and that's kind of exciting. Um, a couple of other minor details. Uh, I've mentioned before that in January, uh, we, uh, we were able to get all the numbers in place and we realized um, and we knew, we knew it, was, it wasn't a surprise. We had been looking at numbers before, but um, we were 47 um, visitations behind. That means that 47 congregations had not seen a bishop in more than three years, which is the canonical number. As of this past weekend, we are 34 visitations behind, which is good news because, you know, for every week that goes by, Bishop Stokes was doing visitations as well in a lot of those weeks. And so uh, in some instances, uh, I'm doing a couple of visitations a weekend. Uh, we're working to get caught up. Um, there are, because there's so many folks that are overdue for visitations, when folks request a visitation, uh, number one, if, if you're not super overdue, you might get bumped a little further down the road as we address the needs in the congregations. We have one congregation that has not seen a bishop since 2015. So we're prioritizing the ones that are, that's a little beyond the three-year window. And so we're prioritizing the, the places where we really need uh, to have uh, visitation sooner rather than later, but we will get everyone on the calendar. If you've emailed once or twice and you haven't had a response, uh, please email again and, and just make sure I'm copied on the email and we'll do what we can, even if the it's not, happening immediately, at least then you should know when it is going to happen. I think we'll be up to date towards the end of the year. Um, I hope so. I mean, with that many behind, plus the ones that, you know, with every week that goes by, I might get a little further behind. So I'm getting, actually getting ahead week by week, but it's not, uh, it's, it's a moving target. So that's the best way to put it. Um, I, I will be out for the first week of June ish because of the college for bishops, which is where they take new bishops, although at that point, I think I will be right or almost at the one-year mark as bishop um, for my summer residential week of learning how to be a bishop. Um, and so I'll be out for that. And then, of course, towards the end of the month, we have general convention. And I am very much looking forward to that. I was at the last general convention as a deputy for the Diocese of North Carolina. Mostly what I remember was sitting for far too long in on very uncomfortable chairs in a packed auditorium while we all tried not to catch COVID. Um, but uh, it'll be different, I think, being there as, as Bishop of New Jersey. And I'm looking forward to what looks like a schedule that is more consistent with what was there in the past. There'll be exhibitors and you know all kinds of things going on. Um, the slate for presiding Bishop came out last month. And so last week I was in Charlotte, North Carolina for the House of Bishops uh, meet and greet with the candidates for presiding bishop. It was an interesting day. I really appreciated everyone who has has come forward to stand for that office. Uh, they all bring gifts, uh, and I am no further, I'm no clearer on who will be the next presiding bishop than I was when we started. So uh, I don't think my vote is is you know as as a bishop you get a vote for presiding bishop, um, and then of course the. The, the deputies, the priests, the deacons, and the and the lay members of general convention confirm that vote, but don't vote directly. I don't think I'm voting just by myself. I'm voting on behalf of the diocese. So I would welcome feedback. And if you have thoughts or concerns about that or anything else related to general convention, I really would be glad to hear from you. You can email me or text me or otherwise be in touch. Um, and I will certainly hear that. One of the things I'm aware of it was named it was raised in the clergy conversation earlier is that if there are people in standing for election for something who who's uh, stated uh, whose statements have not been uh, consistent with what we believe in the diocese of new jersey affirming the uh, the, the the inclusion of of all god's people then you know i will i'd like to know that before i before i vote for something i might be voting for or not um so i'm open to hearing from folks if there's anything you would like to share around that i would welcome 
I would welcome the input from the diocese as I, as I serve in that capacity as your bishop. Um, you might have noticed our website crashed uh, a little, <laughs> a little bit earlier in the week. We're we got it back up and running, uh, and we're working on you know some next steps there. Uh, but just be aware, we we do know it crashed. We actually know why it crashed. It had a number of places in it where the licensing hadn't been updated, and so you know four or five years old. And they uh, and so having got those things back on track, we are able to uh, we got it back up and running, and we're, we'll make some uh, next steps around getting good uh, good safeguards in place so that doesn't happen again going forward. But we are still making some decisions about what communications might look like and how that might go forward next uh, but i did want to mention that so you know you know that we know and also um, that there are plans being developed to address that the final thing on my um, list of i guess there's perhaps several things for me still um i talked with the clergy this morning we are seriously considering trying to put together a diocesan morning prayer on facebook or zoom or something that might be offered by different clergy around the diocese uh, and different congregations taking a turn to do that. Uh, there's enough churches and people that that, you know, if if people volunteer, it wouldn't even be a an every week activity or for, for someone in leadership to do that. It could be an activity once a month and we would be able to offer that. Is that something that would be of interest? Maybe. Okay, great. So if we offer it, we can always try it. And if, you know, if we're offering it and nobody's coming, then we'll We'll know, and we'll be able to uh, uh, to go from there and make decisions. But uh, so we'll be looking at putting that together over the next little while. Um, the school for ministry, we continue to work on strengthening and uh, offering the formation for not only for those in discernment for ordination, but also for the wider diocese. Uh, we're looking at in the fall. We will uh, be unveiling actually sooner than that. We'll be unveiling a few new initiatives through the School for Ministry just as a way to gather people for uh, for formation as needed. I was in a meeting earlier today. We're going to put together a couple of vestry workshops. So you can send the vestry and they can join in um, and we'll do a Zoom, a, a Zoom evening. I don't think we've scheduled a date for that yet. The best way to find out about that is through the, the Friday uh, Good News in the Garden State emails. If you're signed up for those, then you should be able to access the information and the registration links for things like that. Um, but also next Tuesday evening, I will be um, I will be working I will be offering a Zoom conversation around the school for ministry specifically to talk about where we are and what we're planning and offering. And you know we've got a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides and a, a good conversation planned. So if you are interested in that, I can also, I can put the link for that in the chat and we'll make sure that that circulates this week as well uh, in the in the good news in the garden state. But I'm just going to add the link in here. And that's just the Zoom link. I mean, don't use it tonight because it is, uh, it is not, uh, <laughs> we're in this meeting already, uh, but we are doing that. Uh, we are offering that uh, conversation around the school for ministry. So hopefully that will be a help for you and for anyone, if you know people who are interested or who have been uh, participants or who would like to know more, then um, you know they would be welcome to join in the conversation then. I'm meeting with the current students and a few of the people who are very recent graduates for a different conversation next Monday evening, but that is not open to the whole diocese. The one on the 7th on Tuesday evening is. Um, any questions about the School for Ministry? Okay, great. Um, a couple of quick updates on Haitian ministry. I'm not sh certain if Father Robin Pierre is with us in this meeting or not. Um, he may not be able to be here. As you may know, we have a growing, emerging Haitian ministry in this diocese. We have a, a new congregation that is emerging that worships in Creole and French, uh, mostly based out of uh the church, uh, the former Good Shepherd congregation building, uh, the Church of the Good Shepherd in Rahway. And um, that community continues to uh, to take steps and 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 there's real progress in, in developing a new congregation. It's pretty exciting, actually. 
this summer they're organizing a sort of the equivalent of the, the bishops council the mission council the vestry equivalent for that group and when they have a bit more organization we'll be establishing them as a as a special mission congregation that that's the plan at this time um they have recently started in the past couple of weeks a haitian creole and french morning prayer that is being broadcast it will be available through uh youtube and facebook if you have people in your congregations, if you know people who are Haitian and would like a prayer opportunity, then they should be connected with that ministry. We know that in some of our churches, there are people whose primary language is Creole or French, and uh, so they might appreciate this work. It's great to see this happening. It's kind of exciting. And uh, just wanted to share that with you. Uh, we'll get the updates with the links and all the information will be coming out in the, in the weekly Good News in the Garden State that comes out on Friday. So um, that's that's that update there. Um, next on our list, we have an update on Episcopal Community Services of New Jersey, and I'm gonna ask Father Dave Snyder to, to share that. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Bishop. Um, good to be with you tonight. I uh, do have a couple of updates that I'd like to share with the group tonight. First of all, you may or may not know that uh, uh, Episcopal Community Services is an organization in transition right now. Uh, Deacon Tricia Thorm, who was our executive director, has resigned. And um, I raised my hand and am coming out of retirement to serve as the interim uh, executive director until the next ED is called. We've begun the search process already. We're currently working on a, a position description and we'll be advertising this position uh, sometime soon, but we are an organization in transition, so please be patient with us. Uh, the second update concerns the um, deadline for the letters of intent uh, for uh, submitting an application for an ECA, ECS grant in 2024. The deadline was uh, this past Tuesday, April 30th, uh, but and we've already received six letters of intent from six congregations uh, that are intending to submit an application for a grant in 2024. But um, we're going to kind of extend that uh, deadline a little bit. If you, if you have um, uh, a project in mind that you'd like to be considered for funding this year, uh, please send me an email and with the letter of intent and we will consider it. Probably, you know, we need to do that over the next couple of days be before the middle of next week. But, uh, and I will post in the chat my personal email address. So if you have a, a project that you would like to con have considered for a grant in 2024, please send me an email and let me know that and we'll extend that deadline from uh, Tuesday uh, through uh, the middle of next week. Uh, so that's the second uh, update. The third is that this coming Sunday, uh, which is May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, and also the sixth Sunday of Easter, has been designated as Episcopal Community Services Sunday throughout the Diocese of New Jersey. And I'm going to post in the chat right now a link to where you can access some liturgical resources, some a collect for the day, some prayers of the people uh, to kind of help to lift up uh, the ministry of ECS. This is an annual event. We really appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, be uh, present with the congregations uh, and to kind of lift up uh, the ministry of ECS. So this is the opportunity to do that this coming Sunday. Uh, and we would appreciate, certainly would appreciate if you would uh, plan to celebrate in some significant way uh, ECS Sunday this Sunday. And finally, and I think most importantly, I want to express a sincere thank you to all of our partners, uh, congregations, individuals uh, throughout the diocese who have enabled us to really achieve some remarkable success in, the, in just four years. Uh, we were incorporated in March of 2020. And so we've just been in operation for four years. Uh, we've already granted nearly $400,000 in, in grants to 29 different projects. And uh, we've, we will, in 2024, raise our one millionth dollar of donations from 
the uh, the the people of the Diocese of New Jersey. So your response to the to the this organization has been uh, generous and gracious, and we are most grateful. We wouldn't we would not be where we are today without your support. So we we really genuinely appreciate it, and um, uh, continue to pray for for the ministry of ECS and and support us in whatever way you can. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Father Dave. And uh, thank you all for supporting that important ministry. It's great to see uh, to see it bearing fruit in so many parts of our diocese. So uh, wonderful, wonderful update. Um, a quick update on our anti-racism uh, training. I'm going to ask Canon Karen Moore if she'd like to speak to that. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, yeah, we are right now in um, in session. Um, the spring session started last last Friday, and it continues until May twenty fourth, and with the final session um, June seventh. Um, it originally was scheduled to start on April twelfth, but because we had very low uh, registration, we postponed it for two for two weeks, and we did get um, an acceptable number of people um, registered. We also were supposed to have this. We, uh, last weekend and this weekend in in-person um, training. But again, for that, we got very low registration and it was originally scheduled to be held back in January. We had, I think only two people registered. So we rescheduled it for April and we had a, a similarly unacceptably low number. So we, we canceled it and we don't really have any plans to offer in in person again we translate that into the fact that there's apparently no appetite for people to meet in person um the zoom meeting format is i, I guess much more convenient so uh that's what we're going to be doing uh, for the foreseeable future um i know that um there's so much going on in the world today and um, there hasn't been a horrible incident that happened um, that with Black people or other people of color that has has had media attention. So I understand how anti-racism might not be top of mind for people um, with the war, the election, the trials, and everything that's going on now, the protests. Um, but it's still an important thing. It's a very important thing for people to um, to participate in. The whole purpose of the uh, training is um, to to really uh, push for advocate for anti racism, um, to advocate for people who are willing to um, participate. Well, first of all, being aware of the the fact that racism exists and that. It affects everybody, uh, but also to to join the fight to um, to to fight against racism. We we do have a, um, a Spanish language uh, training session that's coming up uh, on May 11th and May 18th. It's going to be online. Um, the registration for that is still open, and so it's going to be conducted entirely in Spanish. So if you know anybody who is um, interested in that, please tell them to go on the website where there is a, um, a link to register. And then for the, for the final training session in 2024, uh, it's gonna start on September 13th. Um, th that registration also is up on the, um, on the diocesan website. I encourage you to um, invite as many people as you know to visit the website and consider taking the training. Even you, if you've taken it before, please consider taking it again because things do change and our curriculum also does change too. Thank you so much. Um, and what I will say is not only, I mean, I've done anti-racism training in a few different places. Um, and I've, two things, one is the the program that we offer here in the Diocese of New Jersey is a fine program. It is it is the best one that I've encountered. And in fact, it is so good. We are the only ones offering it in Spanish across the church. And the Episcopal Church announced a grant today to the Diocese of New Jersey to support the anti-racism training initiatives in Spanish. 
Um, and so that's great news and a, and a great, uh, it's, it really kind of commends, commends our work uh, in that area. Um, and, uh, and, it, and it's good to hear. The other thing in my experience is that um, we do expect clergy and lay leaders in certain positions to have current training, which means to keep it up to date. And, in, uh, and that means taking it again as needed. My personal experience of that is that every time I take, I take a training, I get something new out of it that I didn't have before. It's not ticking a box. It's actually a new level of understanding. So I recommend it to you. Um, we're happy to, if there's a there's a nominal cost associated with it, but if someone cannot pay that, then let me know and we'll see what we can do to make sure that people have, everyone has access to it. Um, I see that Bobby, you have your hand raised. If you'd like to speak, you're welcome to do so. Yes, um, I just wanna say thank you, Karen, for being so honest and open about the you know, the participation and sort of the sense that people have sort of backed up a little because we have a, a group in our own church, which has been active for many years. And we also have hit, this year has been a, a, a kind of a down year for us in terms of regrouping the troops and feeling as if, uh, you know, some people are feeling frustrated that we aren't being more activist, activistic, I guess. And then other people, it's a matter of you know, maybe this is a time for us to deepen our own spiritual connection to this whole social justice and for the group itself to kind of um, do some internal conversations. So I just appreciate your saying that this is something that you're experiencing at your level. And, um, you know, we, we can appreciate each other situation and maybe um, help each other with some of these things. But thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda for tonight is just a quick reminder that on May 18th, we have a diocesan confirmation service at the cathedral in Trenton. So um, the clergy know, so if you if you are interested in confirmation or you know someone who is or perhaps should be, not just confirmation, but also reception uh, or reaffirmation, if God is doing something in your life right now that you'd like to reaffirm your faith in front of the congregation with prayer and a blessing, um, please speak to your speak to your clergy. If you don't have clergy in your congregation, um, please be in touch with your convocation dean or with my office, and we'll make sure we get you into uh, into that service as needed. Um, confirmation or reception is uh, is is one of the ways that we uh, make people members. So it's required for a couple of things that people might be doing, like uh, you are supposed to be confirmed or received to serve on vestry. Uh, or to administer the chalice. And it's also, it's it's absolutely a lovely service. Um, I, I get to do it pretty much every single weekend, thanks be to God, um, but it really is a special thing. And if that is something that you or someone you know might be open to, then, you know, please do come forward and let us know if you're interested in, if you're interested in participating, but maybe uh, you're not sure about the, the diocesan one, then there's always the option of waiting for your visitation or of finding a local, in the, we're looking at trying to schedule for the fall regional um, regional confirmation services. Uh, so something in, in the North End and South Jersey and something somewhere in the middle of the diocese. And uh, there'll be opportunities, but we uh, we would love to, to, to pray with you and affirm you in your, in your journey in that way. Um, I'm next, I'm going to ask Mother Ellen Rutherford to speak about refugee ministry, and I'm going to try and make sure that you can share your screen, Mother Ellen. So I figured out my my workaround on this um, is uh, is that I, I will make you the co-host and that will give you screen sharing privileges, so. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm speaking for the Refugee Resettlement Task Force. And just to remind you that World Refugee Day is coming up on June 20th. Uh, we've gathered a package of materials, uh, formation and liturgical particularly, and a study series that we completed last year and a prayer setting that you can use um, in PowerPoint. Um, you can use these as adapted to your location to celebrate what you're already doing, or maybe to raise awareness of uh, needs and ministries in this area. So feel free to contact me, and I'll be happy to send that to you. 
and uh, I'll put my contact information in the chat. And uh, as the bishop suggested, I send it to morale, so it'll show up in our communications over the next month or so. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And yes, we will try and circulate through uh, Good News in the Garden State so people have access to links and similar over time. If you aren't signed up for that, it is a helpful resource that we send out uh, an email every Friday night or Saturday morning with uh, news and updates and links and all of that good stuff. Uh, and the and and I think you can uh, you can find that on the uh, on the on the website to just to register for that should you choose to do so. Um, at this point, we have covered all of our. Uh, scheduled things to share. I'm wondering if there's anything else anyone would like to share at this time, if there's any, uh, any, I see uh, uh, Rhonda Jackson, you have your hand raised, by, by all means, go ahead. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware that the Board of Missions notification of availability of the annual report and the grant application was emailed to all of the mission churches on April 29th. There is a new due date, which is August 1st, and that's for both the annual report and for the grant application. And we just want to give a reminder that all of the missions are required to actually do the full annual report. It's so the first section and the narrative. And we just wanted to give a little shout out to our subcommittee that just recently hosted uh, their first session, the first three information sessions. And what we did was we actually reviewed the date changes and modifications to the annual report and the grant application. And if there's anyone on here that is a mission church that did not receive it or have any questions about that, I can put my contact information into the chat as well. So thank you for the opportunity, Bishop. Wonderful. Thank you for the update and for the good work that you are doing. Um, there are a few different schedules of things that are changing this year with our change in diocesan convention date. So stay tuned for information about that as we go forward. The big things won't change. Your your audits are still due when they're due. The parochial report is still due when it's due. Uh, but the deadlines and the dates around budget processes and uh, hearings on resolutions and all of that will be a little different because of our planned change. And the, certainly the Board of Missions work is is a key part of that. Um, anyone else have anything you'd like to share about anything that's going on or any questions you might have? I threw a lot of information at you over about half an hour, and I'm happy to uh, unpack something or provide you with more if there's anything you'd like you'd like to know. Bishop, wow. this is Rhonda again. Can I just ask really quickly, how is the sense of uh, the, the bishops, the presiding bishop process, how is that going? And did they just, I mean, did they do it similar to how we did it when we were doing a bishop search? That's a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, so it's sort of similar, but it is not at all the same. Um, because of the way that the, the canons have their presiding bishop elected uh, out of the House of Bishops, the members of the House of Bishops vote. There's a couple of challenges on that. Uh, once a member of the House of Bishops, you stop being a member upon your funeral. So uh, we have uh, voting members in their 90s. And we have, of course, the churches, you know, it's, is a, it, we have the, the House of Bishops skews a little older than some parts of the church. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in order to have full representation, I think our youngest bishops are still Gen X. We don't have any millennial bishops yet. Um, the, the slate for this year's election, I think there is one Gen X bishop on it and the rest are uh, younger baby boomers. So we've got a generational shift uh, that's about to happen in the House of Bishops in terms of the active bishops that may not quite be reflected in, in the voting or in the even really in the candidates for presiding bishop. That's interesting to see. I have deep confidence in the people who were on the nomination committee for the presiding bishop. There are some incredibly gifted and faithful people, uh, bishops, priests, deacons, and lay people who were part of the, the work that took several years to bring forward the slate. And I am aware that there is 
a tremendous diversity and many opportunities. Everyone brings something different and we will be well and faithfully served no matter what the outcome. Uh, at the same time, I'm really curious to see what the spirit does. Um, we The process, as you may know, is that after a long period of silent behind the scenes work where there's much rumors and whispering going on in the rest of the church, a slate is announced. After a short period of potential petition candidates, we had a slate of four and one person was a petition candidate. We now have five candidates. The bishops go to the, the bishops uh, meet and greet time. Uh, this year it was done separately from a regular House of Bishops meeting. So I was in North Carolina for that last week for a day of um, meetings. It must have been grueling for the candidates because they divided us into five groups and the candidates rotated through all five groups. So it was five 40 to 45 minute sessions of talking um, with a short break for lunch in the middle and just, you know, lots of, we began with prayer, we ended with prayer, and then the candidates were in the hot seat for an extended period of time. Um, at, and then when we get to general convention, there is an, an evening when there is a sort of a meet and greet time for everyone. And then there are, the bishops are pulled away. We're told we, we're not to touch our phones or do any, which we wouldn't anyway, but it's a very, you know, it's the, it's the modern day Episcopal church equivalent of the conclave. And, you know, if there's an election, <laughs> they, uh, uh, they, they get the news back and it is confirmed by the house of deputies. Um, and, uh, and then it is sort of, it becomes public and there is a, uh, an event and, a, and a, a bit of a celebration around it. I, I'm curious to see how it looks when we get to general convention. And I have no idea right now who the spirit is calling to be the next presiding bishop. Having served in uh, North Carolina for a while, I can tell you that Michael Curry is a hard act to follow. And by the grace of God, I think we'll get someone who will be able to do that. I see that Canon Noreen Duncan has raised her hand. So, Thank you, Bishop. And thank you for speaking on behalf of our bishops. We do have indeed a wonderful slate, including the fifth nominated candidate. But I think somebody just posted in the chat. You could find a lot of information about the process for the election of our presiding bishop on the general convention website. That is, you go to the Episcopal Church website and go to the general convention office website, and you will find quite detailed information about the process. And Bishop Sally spoke quite eloquently about the role that the bishops play in the election of a presiding bishop. But it is not to be forgotten that most of us our deputies, and I am one of them, as are a couple of more people on this call, I see Bobby here. We are deputies in the House of Deputies, and we also have a part to play in the election of the new bishop, presiding bishop. I was part of the election for the last presiding bishop, our beloved Bishop Michael, and it is indeed a grueling process, but it is a process um, great prayerful process, and it is one that reminds us that we are indeed one church, and even though we vote in two different houses, different from anything else in the Anglican world, we vote in the, the House of Bishops vote, votes, as well as the House of Deputies. At least we vote in a way that, um, that, that validates the House of Bishops election. So again, and I don't know who posted it, thank you very much. Go to the chat and you'll find a link that will show you in layman's terms, how this process, and it is a wonderful process. It's not, not you know, we don't have smoke and all of that stuff, but um, we do at the end of the process, we're quite joyful as we welcome our next leader in the Episcopal Church. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you for that. So it, it is, um, it's going to be an exciting time is all I can say. Uh, Susan, I see your hand raised. Yeah, I I did, you know, it was like a blast from the past. I printed out the profile for the election of the 28th presiding bishop just to look through it, which we did when we were looking to call a bishop. And it was it was uh printed in August of 2023. And what I found interesting of the three most major global issues in the next 10 years 
I wondered whether these three would somehow be shuffled differently right now. The first one was environmental crisis. The second one was violence, conflict, and war. And the third is inequality and division. So we've had a couple things happen since August, 2023. So I just wondered how that affects the bishops that are you know, the, the ones that are running. I think that's a great question. And I am not sure how the candidates would answer that. Um, what I would, how I would answer it as a member of the House of Bishops is that we, um, that the the work that was done to prepare, including the profile, mm -hmm. is a wonderful reflection of the needs of the church and what we anticipate sort of with, with the gift, the intentional gift of a bit of distance. So taking a step back from the day to day, where might the spirit be leading us as the Episcopal Church? What might we need? What might be uh, on the horizon for us to respond to, not on the ground level, but from a sort of 30,000 foot perspective of getting some sense of uh, where God is calling us and what we want to be intentional and thoughtful and prayerful about. Um, the things that have happened since then and the ways that the church and the world have changed and responded both um, both are both meaningful and make a difference and are also at the same time, they're in the context of the bigger picture, which has been discerned. Right. So we would hold both of those things together and try and discern who is, we want the leader who's not just the leader for today, but the leader for the next decade and who sets the course and gives us vision and direction that will help to point this church in the way that God would have us go, not just this year, but for many years to come. And so we have the to- profile, hold The profile was interesting because it then went on to evangelism you know, it's just a good breakdown to see where where people are thinking. And then there is a link for parochial reports and data. You can go on and on. You may not sleep for days, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. Great. Yeah, thank you. Anyone have any other questions or things you'd like to share? not seeing any hands, perhaps we could move towards Compline as it is now almost the end of our hour. And um, I'd like to ask for a volunteer to uh, to say the responses and to read the Psalm as, as we pray Compline together. That way we just have two voices and not 50 voices. Um, is there anyone who'd like to volunteer or can I volunteer someone? I'm gonna, okay, we've uh, okay. We've got Deacon Jerry has volunteered. So thank you for that. Um, I will, uh, I'll share my screen and we can, we can pray Compline together. Can everyone see? We'll begin with just a moment of quiet. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful end, peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our heavenly father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. 
You set me free when I am hard pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you worship dumb idols and run after false gods? I know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Tremble then and do not sin. Speak to your heart in silence upon your bed. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Many are saying, oh, that we might see better times. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine and oil increase. I lie down in peace. At once I fall asleep. For only you, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be present, O merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite you to pray either silently or aloud with all the needs, concerns, and thanksgivings that are upon your heart. I ask your prayers especially for Tricia, for Debbie, for all those who are in any kind of need. I ask your prayers for all places where there is conflict, praying especially for the people of Gaza and Israel, for the people of Ukraine, praying also for all those on college campuses and those who are seeking, uh, seeking a peaceful resolution to difficult circumstances. I ask your prayers for our diocese, for our congregations, our clergy, and our lay leaders, praying especially for all those places where there is transition. Lord, accept all the prayers of our hearts in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night. And give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping. That awake we may watch with Christ. And asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised, for these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations 
and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's really wonderful to see you back. It's been between um, Easter week and uh, convention and all of that. It feels like it's been far too long. Um, I appreciate all that you do for your congregation and for the diocese, and it's good to see you. Um, as we go, I'm going to just ask Deacon Jerry if she could do the dismissal for us as well. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you all. Good night. God bless, and we'll see you soon.